Hello, and welcome to Vaccinating Your Business and Your Life Against COVID-19, uh, brought to you by the members of the Long Island Business Forum and Love Law Firm. I'm Francine Love, and uh, I'm the founder and managing attorney at Love Law Firm. And I'm very proud that this group of fabulous uh, Long Island professionals are help sponsoring a series of webinars to help all of us as we go through this um, uh, just intense time in business and in life. Um, the purpose of these webinars that are free, that are being made readily available to our friends and colleagues in business here is to give some tips about how to not only get out of this um, doing okay, but potentially even to thrive as we um, make good plans and think about the future. Today, I'm very fortunate to have a great panel uh, here with us, and we're going to talk about a series of things. I'm going to talk about, we're all in this remote world, right? And so I'm going to talk about if you're an employer having remote policies, uh, cybersecurity, and things like that to set up your business to win. Um, I also am joined today by Anne-Marie Strauss. Uh, she's the president of I Speak Clearly. She's fabulous, and she's a, um, an executive coach on how to really uh, did do great presentations and to be understood. She's gonna talk to us about how to excel at video conferencing uh, because now we're all doing video conferencing all the time. Uh, Liz Vaz is with me. Uh, Liz is an attorney. Uh, she has her own law firm at Vaz, Vaz Law and she focuses on collaborative divorce, um, peaceful transitions for families. And, and she's just an excellent resource for that. And uh, she's going to be talking about how do we maintain confidentiality as we're working in these shared workspaces. Um, I know that my family right now, we're distributed across the house, uh, doing work, doing schoolwork. And so how do we keep everything separate? So that's, I'm really looking forward to hearing her presentation on that as well. Uh, Conchetta Spirio is uh, the third attorney on this call. Uh, she also has her own law firm, Spirio Law. And uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, the different changes that are happening in the court system right now um, with access to the courts, access to real estate and title closings, uh, as well as notary services. A lot of us have documents that need to be notarized and taken care of. She's going to talk about how do we actually get that taken care of here during this time. Uh, Sandra Nunes is with us. Uh, Sandra is an incredible entrepreneur. Uh, I've known and worked with Sandra now for four years and she's just fabulous. She has a company called Concierge Lifestyle, uh, which I know we're all aspiring to get back to a lifestyle where we need concierge <laughs> uh, attending to us again. And uh, she's going to talk about tips about managing the stress of this entire situation, which we know um, is very stressful. Uh, if my children tell me that I have white hair, once again, I'm going to lose my mind. Uh, and it doesn't help that we now have no access to uh, hair salons. So uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, Sandra on that. And finally, uh, we have Debbie Viola. And as you can tell, Debbie is a fabulous artist because you can see into part of her studio. Um, Debbie is incredible. And she's one of those people who discovered art uh, not at the beginning of her life. At age 40, she discovered art and just took to it like a duck to water. And now she makes her living off of this for more than 20 years. And so she's going to talk about how you can take something that's your passion and cr turn it into your profession. And that may be what some people are going to have to do right now as the economy and some of the dynamics change around us. So that's what the panel is, uh, that's who the panel are, and that's what the topics are. And uh, having said that, let's jump into it, and I'll kick us off with um, the, the portion, oh, I'm sorry, logistics. If you have a question, uh, please don't do chat, please do the Q&A. If you look down at the bottom of your um, screen, you'll see a little thing that says Q&A and you can send questions to uh, the panelists. You can send it to a particular panelist. You can send it to all of us, uh, whichever you want. And we will go through and try and answer questions as they arise. Um, in addition, after each of us speak, we'll give a little time if there are any Q and questions to, for each panelist to ha answer them at, at that time. And then if we need to at the end, we're happy to do it at the end. All right. 
Having said that, uh, how, how are all of our people doing? If you're here and you're hearing us loud and clear and you're enjoying uh, the introduction so far, raise your hand. Can you do that for me? Let's see who can do, oh, look at all these hands raising. Ah, this makes me very happy. Good. All right, I'm gonna lower hands. And again, if you have questions, feel free to send it in the Q&A. If there's any technical issues, tell us that way so we can handle it. Um, let me start off. Look, this is a particularly um, crazy time if you're an employer. And if you have as few as one employee, uh, you are really going through a lot. I just sent out a client alert this morning about all the new uh, paid sick leave and uh, disability leaves that are happening. So uh, you definitely need to be focused on that. And then as we've talked about right now, all of us are moving to remote access. We have to, the governor has ordered it. It's uh, order is in place currently through April 19th. And so if you have a way of maintaining your business, it's gonna be through remote access. Um, and that sounds fine in, in general, right? Oh, okay, everyone's gonna hop on their computer and we're gonna zoom, zoom, um, and we're gonna all talk on the phone and we're gonna get things done. And while that's true, and while that's certainly how most of us are going to sustain our businesses, what I wanna impress on uh, employers is that you have to be very careful about pitfalls that come from when you have a remote workforce. Um, the main three that I wanna highlight are their enhanced risks with people now using their personal devices to perform company business. And I wanna go through a few of those. There's also compliance risks that happen when you now have people who are working from home and are gonna be working, not necessarily nine to five, they're gonna be working all different hours, maybe they're working late, maybe they're working more weekends, and you're gonna have different uh, compliance issues that come up from that, including wage and hour that you wanna be careful of. And finally, another issue that you're gonna have is cybersecurity. And so I wanna delve into each of these three and what some potential solutions are for you as a business owner. So going back to the use of personal devices, and I've talked about this before, um, when you allow people to use their own personal device for business, you're handing over a portion of your business to them that you may never get back. And what I mean by this is if you have now your salespeople making phone calls from their personal cell phone, right, rather than using the the business phone at the office, they're starting to get contacts that are in their phone and they can take those with them should you, they decide to separate from the company. So if you don't have good non-solicit clauses in employment agreements or in offer letters or in your handbook, um, you're potentially giving people contact details and other information about clients that they can use for another employer later. And so you're going to want to address that in your remote work policy about confidentiality. In addition to your own information that may be compromised, you want to think about um, when they're using their own personal devices, if they don't have adequate cybersecurity and computer networks, and they're processing um, clients' credit card information, personal health information, or other confidential data, you could have a real breach that can cost you uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars if it's that bad. Um, the Small Business Association says that uh, most small businesses that have a cybersecurity loss are out of business entirely within six months after the breach because those are so expensive. The amount of money and time you have to put into curing those ills are, is so uh, painful that the biz business can't survive. So when people are using their personal devices, make sure that they are not using uh, public Wi-Fi. Make sure that they have a personal network set up at home. Make sure they have firewalls make sure that they're using passwords that aren't the default password, right? And also aren't easily guessed. Um, I, I'm on Facebook because, you know, you got to share pictures of your kids with someone. And um, uh, one time one of my friends said, hey, let's all share, answer these questions. I, I found this cute survey. 
what was your first high school? What was your first pet's name? Uh, what's your mom's uh, national? Like oh, it was every uh, password clue that had ever. And, and I'm and I send a note. I'm like, dude, don't do this. You know, like you're gonna have every single person have cyber breaches within five minutes of playing this game with you. And they took the post down. Um, but people do that, and and they think it's fun. And you know, I'm gonna share the names of all of my cats. And and then you find out, you know, like that's every password word that they've ever had, right? So make sure that you, you communicate to your employees that they need to have strong password security. Um, another thing is this compliance uh, uh, issues. And the compliance, I want to hit this FLSA issue. Um, once we start letting people work remotely and they're picking potentially different hours, you can easily run afoul of overtime laws very quickly. Um, if you have people answering at all hours and if you're saying, oh, you know, this is a crisis, all hands on deck, we got to get this done. I agree. But understand if they work more than 40 hours, even remotely, uh, they, ha yeah, they have to be paid and they have to be paid the right amount of money. So you want to communicate to people if they're working remotely, the timeframes that they're allowed to work and that, you know, whether or not they have to obtain permission for overtime. Um, Look, it's going to be a bad fallout later as people have lost lots of income as they're having problems. And when they look around and say, where can I get money? Oh, during this time, I worked 60 hours a week and I was only paid for 40. They're going to come and they're going to file claims. So don't let people do work that you haven't authorized and that you haven't said this is the number of hours you can do. The last thing I want to hit, because I know we have short times and my materials are, are going to be included in the packet that you're going to receive, is about uh, cybersecurity. You really want to educate people about all the different threats. And in our last um, presentation, Nanette Watts, and you can go and watch the replay on my YouTube channel, Nanette Watts talked about all of the scams that are coming out right now. There are huge phishing scams. Click here, sign up here. Uh, people saying, oh, I didn't get the payment that I should have gotten. Can you please send it? And they give a link and it's like one letter off of what the actual website is. And so you end up sending the money. Um, she gave the example of Barbara Corcoran. She just sent like a quarter of a million dollars to someone uh, because she got hit by a scam. And she went ahead and replied. I wish we all could lose a quarter of a million dollars and be like, oh, but, um, but it happens to the best of us. Make sure that people know not to click on links that they're not expecting, not to open attachments so that they don't know who they came from. And uh, the key to all of this is designing policies to um, protect against this. I have a remote uh, work policy that people should have, a cybersecurity policy, a confidentiality policy, all of these are things that um, you should implement as an employer. Again, if you have even just one um, employee who needs to uh, work remotely. So having said that, and knowing that part of uh, this discussion involves um, having to maintain confidentiality, I wanna turn this over at this point to my dear friend, um, and colleague and cohort in, in all good crime, uh, my friend Liz Vaz. Uh, as I said before, Liz is a, another attorney and uh, she is very experienced in dealing with issues of confidentiality. And so Liz, I was hoping that you could talk to me and everyone here about ways that you can ensure that um, your clients understand the importance of privacy uh, during online meetings. So first of all, again, I want to thank you, Francine, for hosting this. Again, these informative sessions are really um, fantastic for every business owner, every employer, even employees. And the truth is, I always learn something new from, from everyone who participates. So I'm very excited to be part of this, uh, this wonderful community here on Long Island. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm a divorce attorney. And as an attorney, we are, um, we're governed by certain rules of confidentiality, right? The attorney-client privilege. So in all of our communications, we certainly have to ensure that we're maintaining that privacy when we speak to our client. But even if you're not an attorney, your, your clients, your customers assume and presume that you're going to be discreet in all your discussions, that you're not going to be 
discussing any of their matters, whether it's, you know, they're buying a widget or they are talking about a will, right? So, and, and anything in between, they're going to be assuming that you're going to be keeping that discreet, that you're going to be keeping the communications private. And the truth of the matter is as uh, entrepreneurs, as business owners, um, or even as colleagues, right? Even as business colleagues, we're going to maintain that. We have to maintain that confidentiality. So it's very important that we understand that, uh, again, whether you work for a large company or you work for yourself, we want to ensure that all of our communications, especially now in these times when everything's so digital, we're picking up the phone, we're doing webinars, we're having Skype meetings, we're doing all of that. We want to ensure that we're maintaining that, that level. So Francine made, made some excellent points regarding if you're an employer and having these safeguards in place for all of your employees, but what if you're the employee or what if you're a solo entrepreneur? Uh, what if you're just a startup business? You want to make sure that you're doing this again with your clients, with your colleagues, uh, with any coworkers, anyone. So when you're in a virtual meeting, everybody should really be made aware that these confidentiality rules will be in place, right? So right now what we're doing is a webinar to be distributed, to be disseminated. This is not to be confidential, right? And we understand that this is going to be shared by everyone. This is information for everyone to use. But I will not sit here and now say, oh, Francine, remember that confidential matter that you mentioned to me last week? Here, let me reveal some of that to you while I have you on the, on the webinar. No, no. So that we certainly will not do and we cannot do. Again, as an attorney, I'm prohibited from doing that. But as any business owner, we certainly do not want to do that. Um, we want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and confident in their communications with us. So what I'd like to talk about is it's not necessarily, um, it's, not, it's not necessary, again, for all businesses, but I really think that especially now and even after this crisis passes, I think that more and more people will be able to take advantage of these webinars and start doing this more and more. So I do think that it's good to have these protocols in place in writing. Um, again, I know attorneys, many non-attorneys are like, oh, attorneys just like to have everything in writing and it's all about, you know, covering themselves. But the reality is, if we're all on the same page and we have everything in writing, we can go back to it, right? My memory is fantastic as we're sitting here speaking, but then in, you know, tomorrow when I'm speaking to somebody else, I might forget a little bit of what it is that we discussed and everybody has that. So having these things in writing really helps everybody be on the same page. So my suggestions are, that as much as you can, you have it in writing. It doesn't have to be some legally binding document, 12 pages long, just a very simple bullet point of what it is that the expectations are between you and your clients, maybe some colleagues, some, uh, some coworkers. First thing is, if you're having a private communication with somebody on the phone or via the web, a webinar, Skype, anything, you wanna make sure that you're all on the same page as far as are you recording this? If someone's recording it, then you need consent by all parties. And I understand different states have different regulations, but what I'm talking about here is understanding that as uh, a, a service provider, I'm providing a service to my client. I'm ensuring my client, I am not recording this. This is not something, again, as an attorney, we have different rules and regulations as far as recording. But just in general, we're going to make sure that nobody on the call is recording this. Sometimes you're talking to one person, sometimes you're talking to five people. We want to ensure that there is nobody there, not even a third party. You don't have your friend in the back of the room recording this. This is all information that we're sharing, information that we're gathering. We can take notes. We can certainly follow up with each other with additional questions, but we're going to agree that we're not going to record it. We're also going to ensure that we're in a private and secure location where somebody isn't overhearing, right? Again, working from home is a huge challenge, right? As Francine said, right? We're, we're put in these confined spaces now where we have everyone in the household in the same space. But we need to ensure that when we're speaking to our clients, that we're not talking in the kitchen where people are walking around and they can hear these confidential conversations. Um, that's just a no-no. Uh, also, we also have to make sure that wherever we are, which I'm completely guilty of because the last, the last seminar, the webinar that we had, I lost transmission on my, um, on my computer, right? So my internet worked fine, but the transmission did not work at the other end of the house. So these are things that we just have to ensure that these transmissions work. We test them out ahead of time. And if they don't, which again, technology fails sometimes, that we are given the opportunity to say to everybody, um, again, not necessarily in a webinar, but in a private conversation, my technology has gone down. I need to go and reboot or I need to reset. And we're all gonna agree that we're not gonna continue the conversation while one party is not there. Again, if this is a group conversation and there's three or four of us, we wanna make sure that three or four of us get all of the information. So in place ahead of time, you can have something in writing that says, if one of us loses communication, we're not able to hear that person. The rest of us will either talk about the weather 
or we will just stop communicating and we'll wait for that person to rejoin us. And if for whatever reason that person cannot rejoin us because they can't get that, that service back up, the, um, the internet is down, whatever it is, we can agree that after a few minutes that we're going to end that call, that communication, and we'll reschedule. Um, and leading into that, really the, the most important advice that I can give is for us to just be patient and to be kind to each other. We're going to be embracing this whole new world in ways that we just did not know before. And again, if my internet is up and working at very, very fast speed and somebody else's is not, or the, the internet just gets completely overloaded because so many of us are working at home, we're gonna understand and be patient with each other and say, you know what, this was not deliberate. You didn't not send me those documents because you were being, um, you know, because you were being malicious or, you know, you didn't answer my email for, you know, for some nefarious purpose. No, it's really because um, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to get to it in time. And with so many people now working from home and so many webinars going on, there's so many things we want to attend to. So sometimes you just don't have the time at that moment. So again, we really want to make sure that we're maintaining confidentiality, privacy at all times. We want to make sure that we ourselves as the professional are setting up a space that is quiet and private and ensuring that everyone else who's participating is doing the same thing, that we're going to make sure that our technology is as up to date as possible. And then if and when that technology fails, we're going to just be very patient and very kind with each other and very forgiving. Terrific. Uh, I was working hard to get my unmute button going. <laughs> Technology. Exactly. So it, that's a very apropos uh, transition. Thank you so much, Liz. And I want to really emphasize the need for grace at this time, right? We're going to hear noises. We're going to learn a lot about our friends and colleagues and, and get a glimpse into their life. And uh, look, we're all trying hard and we're working and doing our best. And um, I think everything you shared is great. Um, maintaining confidentiality is key, especially if you're a professional service provider. People count on you to maintain your professionality no matter when. Um, so thank you, Liz. Next up is Anne-Marie Strauss. And I always love hanging out with Anne-Marie. First off, she's wonderful and lovely. Um, but second, uh, whenever I say, you know, have people share what their uh, company is, she's like, Anne-Marie Strauss, I speak clearly. And it, it always throws people for a moment because <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, you do, but what? <laughs> but that's her her company. I speak clearly. She's wonderful in communication, and uh, she's just excellent in helping people be their best in and help convey that. And I've learned so much watching her, watching her interact with large groups of people, and hearing her. So I'm really happy uh, that we get to have Anne Marie join us. And Anne Marie, I was hoping. Um, as we're talking together right now, and let me find, I'm sorry if my computer just went down. Um, how, some people aren't used to um, being in video conferences all the time, right? My spouse is on one right now, and it's her first. <laughs> She's like, oh. uh, how do you in, put confidence in people who are first time video conferencers and, and learning this technology? Can you give us some hints? Absolutely, Francine, and thank you. Before I get started, thank you so much for organizing this webinar and for letting us all learn from each other. Liz, you brought up a lot of great points about confidentiality, which impacts so many of our professions. So I really appreciate the information you shared. And Francine, for your spouse and for others who are on their first webinar, the key to a successful webinar is Preparation. Practice, planning, and preparation are the key. And it, it's just like if you were going to be in a face-to-face -face meeting, you're not going to walk in there without giving any forethought. And it's really the same for a video conference. Yes, there's a camera in front of us, but ultimately you can pretend that that camera is another person and go on as if you were speaking live face-to-face. The tech, uh, commercial years ago was the telephone was the next best thing to being there. But now video conferencing has taken its place and we actually get to see the other person. And therein lies the challenge, but the excitement. 
We are social beings as humans, and we thrive on our ability to have relationships with other people. And I think mm -hmm. it is so wonderful that we have this technology at our fingertips right now during this, during this challenging time, because not only can we maintain our relationships with our current clients and business colleagues, but here we have the opportunity to make new relationships and connections, to develop and grow our businesses and our personal relationships. We can learn from each other, we can motivate each other, and we can support each other, which is something very important at this time. The key to successful, being successful in these video conferencing is, as I said before, preparation prior to the meeting, and then practice for communication that will take place during the meeting and developing an awareness of your speaking and communication skills so that you can maximize those interactions that you're having on camera. <laughs> we're, all, we're all like the TV newscasters now. And interesting, one interesting personal note, I, because it's my profession, oftentimes when a new broadcaster comes on a show or a, an actor or an actress all of a sudden has a talk show, if you're really watching and paying attention, when they're those first few ep episodes, they're a little stiff and they're not natural and they feel nervous, they seem nervous. And all of a sudden, 10 episodes later, wow, it looks like they've been doing it their whole lives. Well, the reality is it's the same for us. At the more you do something, the more comfortable you will become. The brain gets used to what it practices and with repetition and awareness and learning new skills, you'll make it seem easy, natural and effortless as well. And by doing that, you will put the participants in your meeting at ease. So let's talk about what we can uh, do to make this happen. We, uh, there is a handout that goes along with this that you'll get later. Uh, prior to the meeting, it's very important to create a professional space. Clear your desk, make sure the background is non-distracting because you want that person or people at the meeting to focus on you and what you're saying and not be trying to figure out what's hanging on your bulletin board. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two, the audio and vis visual quality of your equipment. Ch test the technology, test the sound and the video. Practice with where you're sitting, making sure that it, when you see yourself on the screen, your face is not taking up the whole, <laughs> the whole screen and you could see your upper body and then there's space above your head. You want to be able to use your hands to gesture if necessary and maximize your communication and the message that you're saying. So once you're set up prior to the meeting, now you want to think about, well, what kind of communication skills am I going to need for during the meeting? And my first suggestion to you is be social. Practice smiling. Smiling is the universal symbol of likability. If you smile at someone, chances are they're going to smile back and they're going to feel more welcome. Smile and as you would in person, make eye contact and introduce yourself. That's something that breaks the ice and allows everyone participating in the meeting to feel welcome and it creates an atmosphere of comfort and warmth that will allow the people in the meeting to be more willing to speak if you want them to, or ask questions at the end because they know it's a safe environment. And encourage the participants to do the same, to introduce themselves and be included in part of the group. The other, the other thing that I would say is to engage your listener with eye contact. Now we said that before as well, you wanna have your seat eye level with the computer, it's not so easy to look at the camera lens. That's the way to make it seem as if you're looking directly into the eyes of the person that you're speaking to. We all want to look at the middle of the screen, but by doing that, now our eyes are focused down. One suggestion and in a video conference, whenever possible, to use visual cues. I have a little visual cue. 
I found this little gizmo in my draw of stuff. And look, it has two big eyes. It's really meant to cover my video camera so that big brother can't see me. But I realized I could put it next to the camera and now I have somebody to look at to remind me that that's where my eyes need to be to have eye contact with the person I'm speaking to. So if you don't have a cool little gizmo like this, you could put your family pet, a loved one, a, a best friend up there to keep your eyes where they need, where they need to be. And then continue to be engaged with the people that you're speaking to. Use a natural conversational tone of voice, add interest and emphasis to what you're saying by not speaking in a monotone and creating energy with your voice. One strategy to help you remember and facilitate doing that is how you're seated in that chair. We all have these nice, comfortable desk chairs with big backs that swivel. And yes, I could sit back like this and speak to you. But when I do, that relaxation con gets conveyed in my voice. So my challenge to you is to sit up on the front half of your chair, feet flat on the floor, back straight, chin up. Now you're opening the airway. There you go, I see some of my uh, web participants doing that, but for you participants I can't see, try the same. That creates an open pathway for the breath to flow freely. That breath is what's necessary to create volume and energy in your voice that's going to communicate the passion and interest in, in your listener. And make eye contact. So if you're not already doing it, try looking at that camera lens instead of at me and see how it feels. This is something you can practice ahead of time with family or friends and get used to it. It's, I would say that's the most challenging part, <laughs> but everybody's different and it's up to you. But keep, keep trying and be confident. Be confident in, in the information that you're sharing and show that confidence in your speaking. Try to be aware of the rate of speech that you're using, because if you speak too quickly, the people listening aren't really going to be able to pay attention to what's important. So use pausing to highlight the information that's important, to give your listener time to process what you're saying, and also pause so that other participants can have a chance to speak. It's important to be aware of everyone getting an opportunity to contribute to the conversation. Make them feel included if that's the format of your meeting. And awareness. Awareness is the key. We're on video, we're on camera, and our nonverbal communication and body language communicate so much. Be aware of your body language, but also be aware of the body language of the participants. Are they looking bored? Are they distracted? Are they tired? Whatever it may be. Just as you would in a face-to-face, -face, note what's happening, make modifications or adjustments to your message and bring them back in. One technique may be to ask a question to someone who seems particularly non-attentive. A, a suggestion to do that in a friendly way would be say their name first and let them know you have a question for them and then ask the question so someone's not embarrassed by having to ask to repeat the question. So for example, Liz, I have a question for you. Is it raining today? Now that person will look at you, start to pay attention. It will also draw the attention of everyone else because they'll think, hmm, she may be asking me a question soon. And that's another way to engage the group. It's hard to engage people face-to-face -face for a long period of time. It's even more of a challenge on video. And that can be a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother webinar. But the first step is to be aware and to modify accordingly as best you can. Now in summary, I'd like to say preparation, planning, and practice are the key to successful video conference meetings. They're also the key to successful video conferencing with family and friends. Use the technology to schedule morning coffee, afternoon tea, 
or an evening nightcap if necessary, and keep those relationships and connections going. Thank you very much. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Anne Marie. And um, yeah, before uh, my spouse had to do her conference, we zoomed from other rooms to one another and <laughs> practice. So, you know, and it feels silly, but um, it was absolutely essential and gave a lot of confidence. So uh, terrific um, pointers that you gave. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to uh, change topic slightly here in terms of uh, now we're all in this virtual world and yet we have these very concrete courts uh, that we are currently not able to get into and um, but there have been a lot of changes and in fact it feels like I'm getting an alert from the New York State Bar Association and the and the court system uh, every couple hours um, and thankfully uh, Conchetta Spirio is here to talk about that. Conchetta is awesome. She is um, she's a top attorney, one of my good friends. She's been a participant in the Long Island Business Forum for I think a little more than a year. Um, maybe it's getting two. I'm just getting old. Uh, everything seems like it was yesterday. Um, but Conchetta is awesome. She's also a member of a network that Liz Vaz runs, uh, the Collaborative uh, Divorce Professionals. And she's a, a strong part of that. She's an excellent person, uh, well-known in all of the networking circles uh, throughout Long Island. And I'm very fortunate to have her be a part of this uh, conversation. And um, she's coming to a, us from a perspective of how do we get uh, some of these materials, uh, these access to the courts, what are we doing about real estate closings and things that are going on and how do I get a document notarized? So, uh, Conchetta, what, what's happening in the last five minutes <laughs> that we need to know about <laughs> and how been, can people? <laughs> it hasn't been that quick, but there have been a lot of updates and changes as the days have gone on. But first I want to thank Francine. Um, she has put together an amazing group of professional people that I absolutely adore. I'm very privileged to uh, be a part of that group um, and um, associate with these professionals. They're all wonderful people as well as being expert in their fields. Um, with respect to the court systems, things have really shut down, but not. Um, they have gone on skeleton to crew. Um, the fortunate thing about being connected professionally to one another, and I thank you for giving me permission to use my hands, Anne-Marie. You had a lot of great tips because being Italian, Liz will tell you I've always used my hands when I talk. Um, so the, the great thing about being connected to other professionals is that we keep each other apprised of what's going on. Um, so an, a group of matrimonial attorneys that have, uh, are in Nashville and Suffolk have created a page where we're all updated uh, by the people that are connected directly to the court system and have a liaison to the court system. So what's happening and what does that mean for you? Um, anybody that has any type of civil matter um, that is in, already in the court system, those cases are administratively being adjourned, meaning if you had a court date, it is not happening. They're putting everything out into right now May or June. Um, they're also not entertaining any new filings, meaning the county clerk's offices where things get filed with the court with respect to uh, how you start an action or if you need an application or you need court relief. They are not taking anything unless it falls within a specific criteria that they have set out and is basically an emergency situation. So for instance, if somebody's in danger or their child's in danger and they need an order of protection, those things are being handled. Um, they still have to be gone through with, you know, getting to the court system, it's best probably to go through an attorney that you know, because they know what's going on and how best to process those things. Um, the court system is technically open, but not really to the public. Um, they're on a skeleton crew and they're only really, really taking emergencies. So if somebody thinks they have a pressing need and if it doesn't qualify by the court's criteria and you'll see in the materials that I gave you, um, there's a list with respect to the order of the uh, order of administration from the court system, the chief judge, uh, administrative judge for the entire court system in New York State put out an order. The good news is they also extended any kind of time limitation. So if you have a statute of limitations to bring an action, or if you're required to respond to something that was served before this crisis, all of those time limitations that we normally have to abide by have been told or stopped or paused, however you want to put it, and they've been postponed. Um, 
with respect to um, anything with the court system, the, the governor's rule is obviously premier, but the court office administration has put, the administrative judge has put together an order with respect to certain criteria. So whether it's family court, criminal court, Supreme Court, or any housing issue, there are certain aspects that are, or conditions or certain circumstances that they will entertain as they deem it to be an emergency. Or if you think you have an emergency, it really better be, because if you bring it before them and they don't consider it a true emergency, they're not gonna be happy. Um, so it's still accessible. With respect to some of the other things, um, the judges, the, the governor's order is temporary. So just so you know, the executive order that went out expires in April, mid-April, I think it's April 18th to be exact. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to end. It, it will probably be expended based on the circumstances and what's going on. So one of those aspects, which I've also excerpted out for anyone here who may be an attorney or is interested in understanding, they have made a provision to do notarization of documents by virtual means. There are several things that you have to do. So if you don't meet the conditions and the requirement of the order, it isn't going to be accepted. Um, there's still some debate among our colleagues with respect to, for instance, you know, in divorce, whether, uh, you know, the county clerks look for original signatures on filing papers that have to do with the divorce action, and specifically the agreement that everybody signs has a specific type of what we call acknowledgement. It's a type of notarization and acknowledgement that gets done when somebody signs such an important document. Um, there's a question as to whether that will be accepted virtual at this moment. Um, but things like closings and real estate, um, title uh, companies, as well as financial institu institutions like your banks, are considered essential. So they are still open. They're restricting some of their hours, and uh, they're obviously restricting their offices based on population of who's staff there. Um, but I have um, a, a title company that I do share space with that is still conducting closings and doing what they need to do. I have I have a client that is in the process of selling their home, you know, they're in contract and they want to know what are we going to do? Uh, they happen to be in Florida. How are we going to get those documents taken care of? Uh, there are ways around it. Some of it is getting documents done in advance for a closing, but they will actually do live closings and they may limit how many people they put into a conference room and how they may stagger how people come in to execute documents. And the title companies are literally there with gloves on you know, they've wiped down tables and conference rooms with di disinfectant, um, and they have certain procedures that they've put into place for the title people to handle documents. Um, so whether they're going to get filed with the county clerk as much as, as quickly as they usually do, I tend to doubt that, but it doesn't mean that the closing won't happen and that, the, that there isn't an ability if you need something urgent, like say a healthcare proxy or, or power of attorney that needs a notarization to be able to get that done virtually. You're just going to have to make sure that the person that is doing the notarization has that order from the governor in their in their possession so that they know there's a step-by-step -step of what you need to do as far as transmitting to each other certain things, not only virtually seeing the signature being done here, but you will have to get ID sent, being able to show it live, that's part of the condition. You may have to transmit that document by fax or email, and then it may have to be notarized and then sent back. So there's a lot of different elements to it. Um, so it's very important to make sure that it's all done properly, obviously, and, you know, there are allowances based on the circumstances, but some things have to be done a certain way. Thank you very much, Francine, and thank you all of you. They've had some great information. Excellent. Thank you so much, Conchetta. I appreciate it. Um, it is uh, uh, an incredible workaround that they're trying to do. So uh, I, I do give kudos to the court system for trying to respond to the crisis uh, uh, as best as they can. So thank you for sharing with us uh, the thoughts there. Um, next up is uh, my dear friend, Sandra Nunes. Uh, Sandra and I have worked together now for over four years and we've done lots of things. And um, uh, did I go in the right order or did I skip Debbie? Did I skip Debbie? I'm a dope. I'm so sorry. Sandra, hold that. I'm going to talk about you in a moment. See, this is good. You, ever, you can see all the things that you shouldn't do. Um, <laughs> next up is my dear friend, Debbie Viola. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and as I talked about Debbie earlier, uh, Debbie is someone who 
is just an incredible artist. If you see, you got to go to her website. You got to look at what she does. It's just absolutely stunning. And here's someone who found her passion and turned it into a profession. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to um, get Debbie to talk to us about today is, you know, if you could tell us some of how you started and what your key tips are for someone who wants to follow in a path like you have and take something that really fuels their soul and see if they can get it to fuel their bank account. Thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, this is such a great panel and uh, very timely. Um, first of all, you don't want to do exactly what I did because <laughs> back then there was no internet to research and to understand. I just kind of went by the seat of my pants. Uh, the events of September 11th thrust me into choosing to decide to live a life of passion instead of life of regret. I ran a nine attorney law firm for uh, 23 years in the city. And um, after September 11th, the way my boss behaved, it was still all about his work. Um, I decided I did not want to work for anyone else ever again. And let me see if I could turn this newfound passion of painting and decorative painting. I had done walls in my bathroom and everybody thought they were magnificent. You know, let me see what I could do with this. So um, out of desperation, I just like, um, I went to SCORE. Um, that's an organization of an, uh, retired executives. And I had this all, by then I had a little bit of a plan in my mind of what I wanted to do. And they're like, you're not gonna be successful, no way in the world. You know, you don't have any business experience, this is not going to work. And that just set me in a motion that, you know what, I'm gonna prove this man wrong. And, um, and I did, but along the way I learned um, locally, Networking. Networking is important. I couldn't just sit at my house waiting for the, the next phone call to come in. You know, when you're just starting a business, it takes a long time to build upon the referrals. So I did the walls in one lady's house, and then maybe three months later, her friend would call me. But, you know, one job every three months wasn't quite cutting it. So um, I discovered a, a BNI, a local networking group. That was the first thing I did. And then I was introduced to other groups and little by little, just you know, forcing myself, I'm quiet, I'm an introvert, I'd much rather sit home and paint. But you, know, you can only be an advocate for yourself. So I forced myself to do things that I didn't like to do um, just by putting myself out there, getting to know people, business people, and then slowly and slowly my reach expanded and people started trusting me and knowing me and they would call me. And um, then I also started uh, painting and um, I learned how to paint and how to teach. Um, the thing is like, let's say your passion is dogs, okay? But it's not practical become, to become a veterinarian. What else can you do if you love dogs? You, you could become the best dog walker. Um, you know, so many people need that service. And now um, with so much research available, there's a wonderful site. It's called answerthepublic.com. I forgot to put that one in my resource, but you could just type in, I did it this morning just to see, I typed in jewelry business and 35 questions came up like who, uh, who should start a jewelry business? Thank you, Francine. Um, what should I name my jewelry business? Can a jewelry business be profitable? Uh, should I make earrings? Like it really hones in on different questions that other people have searched. So you see what's popular searching. Like when I put in um, learning how to paint, it's like how to paint a horse, how to paint a flower, you know, and then you could click on that and see how many people are searching for how to paint a flower. And then you know, oh, I should target on uh, painting flowers rather than horses because more people want to learn about flowers. So it's very, very interesting. No matter what the subject matter is, you could, you know, put put the keywords in, and it will give you information on it, which is great. And another one is a Buzz Sumo, B U Z Z S U M O, and I think it's dot com. But they also have that same type of service where you could ask questions. And it gives you relevant, you know, search answers according to how people searched for it. Um, as far as local resources, um, the second thing I did was I learned about the Farmingdale um, 
small business administration on the campus of Farmingdale College on uh, 110 in Farmingdale. And they have wonderful programs throughout the year. They have all different workshops, but you also can get a one-on-one -on -one mentor. I had a lovely gal years ago when I first got started and she helped me hone in on like branding and things like that. But there are a lot of free resources around and uh, just find out as much as you can. And um, the Miller Business Resource Center as part of the, I think it's the Middle Country Public Library. That's a wonderful, wonderful resource. They could help you with things like um, if you needed certain demographics, like if you wanted to find the, the richest uh, zip codes on Long Island, who you should target, they would help you out with that. Um, great resource. I don't get to use that too much because, you know, I live in Massapequa, so it's a, a trek for me, but it's a very, very excellent resource. Um, if you're a woman, there's uh, specific um, women-owned businesses, um, a lot of organizations, uh, how you could deal with the government if you're a minority or a woman business owner. Um, let's see, let's see. If you want to, if you just a just a local business and you think, okay, you know, I can only serve my local community. Like me as a decorative painter for years, all I did was, you know, walls and furniture and cabinets. I can't scale that online, right? But now I'm realizing in this day and age, all my knowledge, I have over 20 years of knowledge of how to paint cabinets, how to paint walls. I found someone, she was doing what I was doing and, um, she did a video she was one of the first ones in the field years ago she did a video on how to paint cabinets the first year she sold a hundred thousand dollars worth of that fifty dollar video incredible so if you have any sort of knowledge about any subject every lady sitting here on this panel you could come out with a little ebook or something for free and just put yourself out there become known in your field go on Facebook or LinkedIn, whatever, whatever platform you feel most comfortable with, because ultimately when people are looking for those services, they're going to remember, oh yeah, I remember that lady, I think her name was Francine, I saw her pop up on Facebook a few times or I saw her on LinkedIn. And they may not need you now, they may not need you a year from now, but you know, you'll stay top in mind, the more, the more presence that you have. I can't tell you how much work I've gotten off of Facebook. I've had interior designers that I'll meet at like um, a design event. Debbie, I love that finish that you did. Now I have a client. I didn't even know they were following me, but I'm on their radar just because I just try to put myself out there. Like now with this pandemic, I'm trying to go live. Like I'm a night owl. So I'm up sometimes the other night, 3.30 in the morning. I, I, I did this painting live on my uh, page. I just sat there and painted. I put classical music on my friend's music. And just to like offer like some calm and peace to people. And I get so many lovely comments about it. Do I, have I gotten business from it? No, not at all. Um, but it keeps me out there. Maybe a year from now, they'll want a painting or they'll want something and they'll remember me. So um, what I have to say is if you, if you want to start a business and you're just going to say, I want to sell mugs, that sounds like a good thing to do. If you're not passionate about it, that may not be the good thing for you. Find something that you love, that you want to do day and night, because um, your brain just doesn't shut off. If it's your passion, you're going to think about it from morning till night and think of ways of promoting yourself. Um, so make sure it's something you really love and want to do. That's my biggest advice. And if you have any questions at all, I'm certainly not the expert. I've managed to stay afloat for 20 years. Uh, I did things the hard way, but um, you know, feel free to reach out. My contact information is there. I probably have a ton more resources over the years that I just didn't think about, but um, I'll come up with them if you reach out to me. Thank you, Debbie. Um, you know, you're inspirational because less than 1% of every business that is started lasts more than 10 years. Wow. So you have really done something incredible. And wow. so tips from you about how to start and maintain a business based on your passion are meaningful because you didn't start it last week. You know? right. uh -huh. you, you've been doing this for, for 20 years. So thank you so much for sharing. And uh, I know you're someone that inspires me with what you've done. So thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. And so now, uh, Sandra, now I can talk about you. Sandra and I have been friends for uh, four years and we've been working together that entire time. And Sandra is just um, an amazing entrepreneur. Uh, she uh, is really great at learning how to understand the, 
just the way when the, when the world shifts around her, she's the first one to pivot. And so she's excellent at that. And I always see her handle it with just dignity and grace. And so when we were talking about, you know, topics we wanted to share for this webinar, one of the things we said is, oh my goodness, people are so stressed. Um, and I know everyone feels that even people who handle stress well are feeling it these days. And so I asked Sandra, having watched her deal with all sorts of situations, if she could share with us quickly here um, some tips on how to manage stress in a super stressful uh, situation. So Sandra, can I hand it over to you? Absolutely, Francine, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really am honored to be a part of this group of professionals as well as um, everyone else has been saying. I love everyone in this group because we're all very um, supportive of one another and this webinar that you've put together is just fantastic. Um, there's a lot of great information here that I'm even uh, gleaning from the group from the part one and now from part two. So thank you Francine for doing that. Um, so, you know, as we know, there, there isn't anyone who isn't affected by the coronavirus, whether it's actually having contracted the virus, knowing someone who has, um, or a company has closed and you are now working from home and your children are also home from school. Um, so working from home can be challenging in and of itself, especially when the little ones are home too. So I just wanted to share a couple of things uh, with you on how you can try and minimize the stress and perhaps uh, find ways to um, find some time for yourself. So um, it's, it's not easy to be handling multiple additional responsibilities with having to work from home and now your family's home, so you have to be doing it all. And that's usually what we think we have to do, but that's not true. Um, when you look at all of your tasks on your to-do list for your work environment, um, you may have had an assistant at your office and now you're home and you don't have one. So what you can do is um, think about the hiring a virtual assistant. That can help with taking things off of your to-do list so that you can do the things that only you can do that can make money for your company or make you productive in your position in your company. Um, some of those other things can be handled by someone else, even though they are important and they need to get done in order for you to complete your job, but you don't have to do everything. Uh, virtual assistants can help in things like, um, especially now with the you know no, no touch environment, um, it seems that emails just won't do it. Rather than an email that can get lost among the current chaos, because everyone's getting so many more emails now because of uh, the coronavirus, let them know it's a great way to contact them by phone and have the virtual assistant just contact them and let them know what your current situation is that you are working from home you're thinking about them and you just wanted to let them know what you're although you're adversely affected by the situation you're still here for them reassuring them and letting your clients know that it's you know you're still going to be available for them and your clients will appreciate your thoughtfulness, and they'll know that they can trust you with their needs no matter what. Um, they can do many things for you like ordering supplies, groceries, et cetera, return phone calls if you're getting inundated with calls because you're just trying to catch up um, because of the transition from your office back to your home and then having to deal with setting up an office in your home um, and, and many other administrative duties. So this can take a lot of time off of your plate um, so now, since you've gained more time back in your schedule by using a virtual assistant, you have more time that you could spend with your family. Uh, a couple of tips here on how to do that. Um, Pre-plan your schedule for the day and have your spouse and your children involved in planning it with you. This way, everybody's on board, everybody feels a part of the plan, and everybody feels like they're included. Um, and between you and your spouse, you can stagger your breaks, your lunch time, um, so that way you both can share time taking care of the children and being involved with them throughout parts of the day. When the whole family is involved, this can lessen the stress from one person having to do it all. Um, so think about that, and that, that's the end result that you want to have is less stress. Sharing and preparing of meals with your spouse 
Um, you could take breakfast, he can take lunch. Let the kids get involved too. If they can stand on their own and hold a stirring spoon, they can help you with the meals. <laughs> when planning your schedule, have the kids involved in planning the meals. Ask them if they want eggs or waffles. Give them two choices and let them know that they must work together as a team if you have more than one child um, to decide on what the one breakfast item is going to be for that day and then compromise and let the other person have their breakfast um, item the next day. And they'll feel, again, part of the family, part of all the work schedule, the new way of living together as a family while you're still, you know, home working as well. One other thing too, which is really important and, you know, space permitting, you want to set up a small workspace. It's easy to just jump from spot to spot at home and get distracted by counter clutter or home responsibilities and not feeling in the mood to work. That's why establishing a dedicated work area is so crucial to your success. So when you're, you're creating this workspace, consider the type of environment you operate best in. Do you need total privacy, a little background noise, or easy access to the kitchen for refills of coffee? Um, it's also a good idea to define what derails you so you can eliminate distractions. You know, that creative avoidance starts to happen. You see a pile of clothes, the laundry that needs to be done, and you figure, oh, let me go throw that in real quick. Um, so, you know, dishes in the sink, street noises below your bedroom, or the appeal of a television. So make sure that you um, don't have those things that distract you around um, the area that you need to work in. Understanding what facilitates and hinders your work will help you identify the best place to set up shop. It's important to settle on a place you enjoy spending time in. If it's pleasant and it's comfortable, you will more likely be willing to sit there and work in that location and be more productive and have less stress because you're in a comfortable environment and probably more comfortable in your cubicle. So be careful you don't fall asleep if you're making your space in your bedroom. And don't forget to set boundaries. Let the children know that your space is yours and set a space for them as well and that's their space during their time together alone, or if it's an only child, and then um, uh, have your space and let them know that they can't come into your space if you put up a sign that says meeting in, you know, in pro progress, or I'm in a meeting, whatever is easiest for them to understand. Um, take breaks often, if, if it, even if it's just a few minutes, to restore and rejuvenate, to get, uh, to, to get up and walk away from your work area, especially if you spend time in front of your computer. One thing you can do is minimize your tired, achy feeling eyes. So to practice, what you can practice is the 20-20-20 exercise. Every 20 minutes or so, look about 20 feet away and from your desk or from your area and let your eyes linger for 20 seconds on something. Now, not your coffee cup or your phone. If you have a window, that's great. Maybe that's a great place to set up your, your space where you have some natural light coming in and take those breaks every 20 minutes or so. So that relieves a lot of the stress in your eyes. Um, having uh, you know, several quick relievers on hand, such as breathing exercises. You know, If you wanna take some deep breaths and do maybe a meditation or um, reframing techniques, different ways of looking at a stressful situation, trying to look at the positive side, because there's always a positive to a negative. Um, and that can also help you know, as well with long-term stress management strategies in place, like a regular exercise or meditation, um, a hobby, supportive social circle, and you can do that through Zoom, like we're doing here, have a Zoom girls' night out, and just chat with your girlfriends with a glass of wine uh, in the evening after the kids have gone to bed. Um, to maintain the kind of stamina and focus that's required to give the best for your children and work, it's important for you to take care of yourself the way you take care of your children and your family, by getting plenty of sleep, healthy food, and at least some downtime. Um, set up a plan for your children. You can do Zoom parties with other children. You can um, uh, you know, get in touch with their parents and, and have it set a set time where they can get together. They can see each other, talk to each other. There's a lot of online free um, uh, programs that are available. Some of them you do have to pay for. There's music lessons for singing and playing instruments. There's art lessons. There's storybook time. Um, that there's actors that actually narrate the, the story. So it's really neat. They're hearing like an actual 
movie going on, but it's a story being read from a book. Um, take some of those ingredients you made for breakfast and turn it into a study unit. Eggs, where do they come from? What food group do they belong in, et cetera? And how many different ways can it be used? And plan the next meal, maybe dinner, using the ingredient from, ingredient from breakfast so they have something to look forward to that um, they'll be involved in. Um, you can incorporate many different types of you know, board games and things like that, that you've already have, um, but some of these other areas are, are interesting as well. Um, if you have a yard, if you do have access to a yard and they're just so energetic, you can let them out and have them do an obstacle course. Run out back, touch five trees, and then return back into the house and go out the front and touch the mailbox and come back in the house and get some of that energy out from that cabin fever that's been building up. For older children, you can check with the Department of Labor for the laws governing the employment of minors and, you know, have them, have them work for you. Make them your virtual assistant, and this way they can make some money, and it keeps them occupied as well. And then at the end of the day, just real quick, make sure that you save some time for yourself at the end of the day for you and your spouse, or, your, or your, your, you, know, you and your spouse. Take staggered times to take a break. Go have a nice hot tub. Uh, take a hot bath, um, meditate, go for a walk. And then when you come back, then your spouse can go and take their turn. So that way you have a break and you can get some downtime on your own to kind of relieve some of the stress and then get back into family mode, leaving work behind because now you've just switched hats again. So um, that's what I have to offer. And if there's anybody that has any more questions for me, please let me know. Those are terrific. Thank you. And um, I can tell you, uh, I know my family's already been implementing some of those. Uh, we have a play date with a, uh, a couple friends uh, for my kids this afternoon. Uh, we have a cocktail party planned uh, a couple, uh, later uh, Thursday night with uh, some of our friends that we, we miss and who are also doing this uh, whole social distancing. So uh, those are all great things. And really the big thing, I believe through all of this is we're seeing the importance of relationships. And I sent a note out to my, my clients uh, recently about um, unintended consequences of this uh, uh, whole shutdown. And to me, it's been once again, finding out how important relationships are. And I'm very blessed because I have lots of great friends, as you can see right here um, on this uh, channel and this presentation. Friends will get you through this, family will get you through this, and I look forward to doing more webinars here as we try and get through this together, because we will. This will end, we will come out, and we're gonna see a brighter future, and we're gonna do that having gone through it together. People will remember who we were and how we were during this time, so let's make it a great memory. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you for being my friends and for helping me uh, at this time. And we look forward to seeing you. We're gonna do another one next week, topic and time to be announced and look for the materials coming to your email box shortly. Thank you and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.